So, um, right, will we introduce ourselves? Who we are and why we're here? Okay, we'll do. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Tom Moore. I'm a co-founder of Cartoon Saloon and I uh, directed or co-directed three uh, animated features based on Irish uh, folklore and history. Um, the first one was The Secret of Kells, then Song of the Sea, and most recently, uh, Wolf Walkers. And uh, we were really delighted to be able to work with Peter uh, on some uh, special edition versions of posters for those films. And uh, I'm Peter Diamond. I'm a Canadian illustrator living in Vienna and uh, a big fan of Tom's films and of folklore in general. And I, I do a lot of work in posters, uh, alternative movie posters and the like. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a real treat last year to do these three posters for uh, three of my favorite films. Oh, you. It was lovely though. I met Peter um, a few years ago. I think it was our first uh, Kilkenny animated festival here in Kilkenny. And what was cool about it was we wanted that festival to be about a little bit broader than just strictly animation, but basically everyone who draws, we had tattoo artists talking about their work and we had illustrators talking about their work. And that's when I saw Peter's work. Uh, he gave a great presentation. And of course I'd seen it before we invited him, but it was amazing to see him talk about it. And we met then. And so I think even then we were starting to cook up an idea of how could we work together. Yep. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the presentation that I gave um, and that all three of us, because it was you and I and Ali Mercado all did presentations, okay. they were all concerned with, uh, you know, working with history and folklore as as your your raw material for making art. And that's a that's a big thing for me. Um, it's sort of my main focus uh even when i'm doing commercial work like I, I if there's anything in it that's got like a historical aspect to it or a folkloric aspect to it i try to pull that out and so yeah i mean you know we just i think we saw how much there is in common between the ways that the things that we're working on but also i think we have similar tastes like we both love you know um you can steal and art nouveau and klimt and yeah, you know, turn of the session stuff I, I think we're both a little old fashioned artistically. Yeah, is... the fact that you were in Vienna, of course, links to my ongoing long term love of the, the Vienna succession movement. And the, yes. you know, when I was there visiting to see a retrospective of the Egon Sheila's drawings, uh, we met up and my wife had an exhibition there and stuff. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a nice connect. It's a nice added connection as well that we both have those influences. So I might ask you, Peter, some of these questions, but the first one seems maybe a little bit more directed towards me. Life with yeah. Owen Wolf asks, you intentionally break the laws of perspective in many shots from your films. Was it a collective decision? Uh, as a collective decision, I don't know. I think it came from the development period on Secret of Kells when we had just graduated from college. And I guess it was collective. In that, the whole group of us who were working together at the time in Cartoon Saloon, we're really looking at what could hand-drawn animation do that CG couldn't, and what was, how could we, like, we we loved, there was an unfinished masterpiece by Richard Williams called The Thief and the Cobbler that was very um, inspired by uh, Persian miniatures, for example, and they really played with perspective there, and we all loved comic books and illustration, and we wanted to sort of bring the the language of illustration to to our films, and make a virtue of the fact that the films were hand-drawn and that in hand-drawn animation you're you're just as closely aligned to the history and language of of drawing and and illustration and comics and painting as you are to cinema and uh, the history of photography and, and film so we, we kind of wanted to straddle that gap and then that's part of why we play with perspective and try and do things that are uniquely possible with a uh, hand-drawn animation yeah, I, I actually also have a, a couple of um, thoughts on that, that same idea. I mean, one of the things I love about the work that you do is, I, and I like the way I've heard you put it that way before, talking about the language of illustration. And the way I had remembered it was that you'd said the versus the language of photography, right? Because most of what we watch is with a camera. Mm -hmm. And even CG, modern CG animation is, in a sense, filmed with a camera. Mm -hmm. um, and... For me, I think uh, one of the things I would say when when people mention the laws of perspective 
is to remember that the laws of perspective are not the kind of laws you have in a society that you're born into. They're the kind of laws that you choose to follow if you join a voluntary club, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. There's mm-hmm. nothing that says you have to use perspective, which is a which is a constructed set of rules, the goal of which is to more closely imitate the eye or the camera. And there's no reason that you have to do that. And for, for me personally, because I also don't tend to follow the rules of perspective unless I have a specific reason, is that it's just, it's liberating to me artistically to get to put things wherever I want them. Mm-hmm. Um, but also um, it calls back to older art forms from the days before anybody invented perspective. Because perspective is the new kid on the block, really. Mm-hmm. Um, and you look at all the old stuff and they, they didn't have those rules at all. And they, uh, yeah, they, they arranged their art much the, differently. The hierarchy of iconography, when you look back into the Middle Ages and before, it is interesting. It's picture making in a very um, pure way. It's not trying to imitate reality. And it's a little bit closer, I think, to the mind's eye or the language of dreams or something. So, yep. uh, yeah. That's right. Okay, so Aline... Neil Jacqueline, Alina Jacqueline, I think his person is called. Apologies if I got it wrong. It's a good question I'd like to ask you, actually, Peter, as well, is who are your illustration heroes or other artists that influence and inspire you? I know we touched on it a bit there. Well, I suspect that your list is very long and mine certainly is too. Um, but one of the ones that I come back to all the time in terms of people who've uh, kind of driven the way that I actually draw on a way, like to an extent that I can't even resist because it goes back so far as uh, Stan Sakai. He did um, did, uh, Usagi Yojimbo, the samurai rabbit Rabbit. um, comics, which was like, I still have a a copy. The first thing I ever bought with my own money was was one of those comics. And I I still have it and it's pristine because I love it so much. And uh, yeah, I just soaked that stuff up and the way that I draw is, is hugely influenced by him and uh, Franco-Belgian uh, artists like, uh, you know, Hergé from Tintin and mm-hmm. Uderzo, who drew Asterix. Mm-hmm. And so really clean line. Thin clear. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's, that's the biggest thing. And then as far as contemporary people who set an example for me professionally, I'd have to say uh, Yuko Shimizu, who... Um, uh, I, I learned, I was a student of hers uh, in a workshop some years ago, and um, she's very much, uh, it's, as far as living people, one of my, one of my heroes. Mm. What about you? Interesting. Oh, gosh, I'm just looking at your shirt and the Haida inspired um, mm-hmm. creative art, and I'm thinking that I've discovered on my journey a lot of the art that I loved. I, I keep going back further, you know, I keep, I keep finding the, the, yeah. The, yeah. the, the, the stuff, and um I'm I'm more and more inspired by the sort of shamanic indigenous art that you see. And at the same time, and and, and that's very inspiring for me. And um it's the kind of thing that you know you could imagine you might see on a in, in, in a fire, you know, in, in any time in history, sitting around a fire being told stories and how things are presented to you, that kind of amazing um sort of 2D representation of the, the dream space. And I find it fascinating to see in Native American art, in Irish art, in the, uh, indigenous art all over the world, including the Haida that you, your shirt made me think of. So I find that fascinating. And then on the other side, I've spent the last six months going deep into studying, you know, Rubens and learning to paint, oil painting in the kind of Dutch style and doing a lot of anatomy, life drawing, classes in the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris so I find myself constantly kind of going to either end of the spectrum and that's why I think I love Gustav Klimt for example because part of one image that you would see from him will have this almost indigenous abstraction and beautiful yeah. classical figure drawing and that's what I like about your work as well Peter that it seems to fall somewhere in it's able to kind of play on that spectrum even in the same image you know so I love that that's the that's the big goal for me like that's um i don't know you, you alchemists used to have their you know their their holy grail of what was it making making lead into gold or something and mm-hmm. you know my big thing that i will probably never manage but i'm always trying to do is to 
you know, it's like a grand unified theory of, of, of the picture plane where, you know, you can do both of those things at the same time. Cause I want to have both just like you. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I love a lot of the, you know, the classical Western, you know, naturalist kind of mm. art, especially for figures, right. When it comes to people, mm. that's what really speaks to me. And then, as you said, all of the, much older uh, modes of drawing and picture making. Um, I, I, I want to have I want to have my cake and eat it too. I haven't quite figured out how to how to merge them in a way that I'm always happy with. But yeah, that's the goal, and yeah. that's exactly how I feel about Klimt as well. Like exactly. It's funny when I was in Paris, like I would spend a day in Musée d'Orsay and be totally into that stuff, and then go to the Saint Pompidou and kind of really dig what a lot of the 20th century modernists were doing because they were almost like cartoonists sometimes, you know. And what I loved about that was that they were, you know, shaking things up. And but in the way, like I think I am always drawn to the sort of the earlier stuff where they were just on the path away from figure. Uh, figurative work and into abstraction once they go all the way into abstraction and conceptual kind of loses me a bit sometimes and yeah. the stuff that you know you walk through the Rijksmuseum museum and there's room after room of kind of brown very beautifully skillfully painted images but very similar subject matter they were sort of like these portraits for you know rich burgers or whatever and you know yeah. you know yeah. uh, the skill is what attracts me to those and sure. the experimentation is what attracts me to the guys in the middle. And, and I always found it fascinating that people like Picasso and so on looked back to, you know, African tribal masks and, you know, indigenous mm -hmm. mark making and stuff and was trying to find a synthesis. So that continues to be the, I think the answer is everything. So <laughs> we love yeah, everything. Right. We love yeah. everything. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. the next yeah. one is yeah. from the same person asking the question. And uh, I think it's very practical and I think it's particularly for yourself is like, how do you start looking for professional work as an illustrator? Did you rely on networking, word of mouth or something else? Well, I'm very glad that, uh, that the question is framed as it is asking, how did you instead of how do you? Because I never want to give anybody advice on how they should do it because it's been it's always been very difficult for me. I'm not a good businessman. Um, but how I did do it was the way that I started was working uh, for friends, to be honest. I, I started the first illustration work that I did was not was not paid illustration work. I, a friend of mine um, now departed, uh, started putting on punk shows in our small town in New Brunswick. And I basically plugged in the sound system and drew the posters and he did everything else. And I got into doing posters and working with type and trying to draw people's attention and seeing my my drawings get out into the world. So that was where illustration started for me. And from there, when I was in um, art school and started trying to make some money with it, doing these gig posters for free for for fun, um, started to bring in bands saying, well, can you do our album cover? And um, I would do album covers for local bands for, you know, something like 400 bucks or something and string as many of those as I could together in a year while washing dishes and chopping onions in a restaurant. And, you know, that built up and gradually I learned other ways of doing it. Um, but really it started finding ways to make things, you know, locally. And, you know, I was able to grow it from there. And now it's got a lot more to do with having an internet presence, having a body of work that people can look to, being visible wherever you can and straight up writing to people that you're interested in working with. Mm. So, yeah, that's that's how I did it. I think, it, I mean, I think it's hard to pare down the constants because everyone's story is slightly different. But I would say it is something yeah. along the lines of make good stuff, get it out there, make good stuff, get it out there and, you know, kind of, yeah the people yeah definitely there's there's you know there's smarter and less smart ways of doing so um the getting it out there part is is the hard part but obviously it starts with making the best work you can right fascinating i was just at a uh, a festival in berlin uh, last weekend called playgrounds and again it was a mix of animation vfx and illustration and it was a phenomenon i'd never encountered before i'd heard about it but it was the sort of the self-taught instagram illustrator who 
right like, there was one one uh, girl and she was amazing work and she taught herself and online and you could see the progress of her improvement but that her career was totally built on instagram based yeah. on drawing you know fashion like characters in the latest fashion and she built up so many followers that she can make a living with <clears throat> paid promotion you know and like to me you know that didn't exist maybe 10 years ago that no. wasn't a way to make a living and it's quite fascinating for me that she has a, a you know a living and a massive following and so there's so many ways to do it it's almost like you know pick your pick your path and and, and try it you know but um yeah it's very hard to say what's the best thing but yeah definitely the networking word of mouth is a big part of the getting paid for your work i think in the traditional m mode you know just yeah. start getting yeah. some jobs yeah. like my first uh, one of my first jobs out of college was illustrating Irish language books, St. Patrick, comic books about St. Patrick, you know, and I really, really went to town on them and tried to do the best job I could and brought in lots of my influences from uh, classic art and everything like that, because even though it was, you know, it was a small enough job for a small publisher in a language not that many people speak, I knew that if I did a good job that it would be a, a gateway to more stuff and, you know, sure enough, yeah. they won some awards and kind of helped put us on the map. So I think it's just getting any work that you do out there and doing it to the best of your ability and then trying to leverage that to, you know, get bigger jobs from that maybe. Yeah, and if if anybody you know uh, is is thinking of this question more in the general terms of you know what should they do, uh, I guess the one thing I would say is this like this format of of asking a question some to somebody online um, is it's not gonna it, it's not really if if that's all you can do then do that but if you can find anybody who's who's done it. Mm. Uh, near you, anybody you've got access to where you can actually take some time and sit down with them, um, maybe, you know, more than once, because everybody's answer is a little bit different and depends on what you're trying to do, depends on where you are, uh, loads of different stuff. So if you can ever have a real conversation with somebody who's been there and done it in person, that's the first step to take, I'd say. Yeah, it's crazy because uh, one of my stories as well is like early on when I was in college, I was sketching on the bus. And this is the late 90s and I was just sketching on the bus and the guy sitting beside me said, oh, you're an artist. And we got chatting and he happened to be doing this website. And that was like one of my professional jobs. So I have no idea where they're going to come from. And then on the other hand, there are established ways like getting an agent, you know, making contact with publishers and stuff like that. So it's a bit like finding your tribe and then being open to the opportunities wherever they come from. Yep, no doubt. Right. We have plenty to get through, so we should keep going i like this one emmy artist 76 says loving these posters were you in any way influenced by stained glass windows as i'm getting a vibe from them well sadly the answer is no um except in except to the extent that you know we answered before both of us feel you know we're i love stained glass it's wonderful um and i see some parallels to you know, I work on a, on a backlit screen, mm. at least when I'm doing the colors mm. and that's very much like stained glass and I love stained glass. So yeah, it's, it's, it's you're, so you're, you're noticing a real connection, but as far as actual inspiration, no, I, I wasn't thinking about it that way at all. There was some, I would say that they were a part of the, the big melting pot of inspiration for the original movie style. So maybe that, that makes sense. Through there, you know, especially for Kel. Yeah. Okay. These ones are easy ones to, to, to answer quickly. Uh, Asamza, Asamza asks, why is there no Ashling's human form in the illustrations? Why, Peter? <laughs> well, I wanted the, I, I wanted, uh, I wanted the animal form. It's the easy answer. Uh, we had that in, in the previous posters. Uh, Secret of Kells was the one we did last. Um, and I, I loved having the, the accompaniment of, of the animal and the, yeah. and the human. Um, and I think it's kind of key to the, a lot of those movies. So makes them all match up. Yep. Yeah, cool. Yeah, good yeah, answer. That's that's really that's really it. I didn't want to have her in there twice. Well, here's Happy Hagfish, and they're like, "How does the history of Ireland inspire storytelling and artistic decisions?" We could talk about that for an hour, but I suppose it's it's the water you swim in. You know, for me, like in the in the films I make, and I presume that's that's aimed at me because. 
yes i'm sure history in general and folklore in general and definitely the british isles i've seen in your work but for in me in particular history of ireland is um being the backbone or the backdrop for all the first three features that i've done and i think it was just yeah i think one grew out with the other to be honest secret of kells was the first idea and somewhere along the line of making that the idea of the trilogy came along and somewhere along the line of each movie i hit on what the next one would be about and they often grew out of research from one would would go into the next so like during secret of kells i had the idea for song and sea while working on secret of kells and there was lots of stories and folklore that there wasn't really a place for in secret of kells that i started to think of for the next two and they are kind of related in that the folklore is all related and they're also related to the the very first research and the very first work that I was doing even as a teenager um, thinking about um, th this kind of stuff and the kind of stories I wanted to tell as a, as a filmmaker or as an artist. Um, so they all kind of one grew out of the other. And um, I guess it's just it's it's, a, it, it's such a rich vein to tap into and to mine um as a storyteller that i think you could spend several lifetimes just working on stories based on ireland's history um but that's not to say that i will okay so bts4 if there all oh, right sorry this is also a bit directed to me towards me if there was a wolf walker sequel or series what do you think the story would be well do you know what bts4 your ideas would be much more interesting at this point than mine so whatever you imagine um I, I had a I had a moment and it, it probably won't happen, but I had a moment where I considered what if they went to America, you know, what if the what if they left the country when they got to the West and the, that little family that that they've become that little chosen family ended up in America because that time period in America was interesting. And of course, Native American uh, folklore has a lot of shape shifting and, and animal totems and stuff involved in it. But honestly, I don't think there'll ever be a Wolf Walker sequel and ideas like that are best in the in the minds of the fans, you know. All right, so why S. McCarthy? When you set about illustrating and creating, do you use a studio and stay in one environment or do you find wandering as you create to be more beneficial or use a combination of different environments? Just curious. It's interesting, Peter. You've got a beautiful studio behind you there. Mm. Yeah. Um... Well, when I was uh, working at home in a uh, sort of, I think it was eight square meters, maybe, uh, I, I used to go out a lot more. Um, I liked sketching in cafes a lot. I liked having my brain sort of half disengaged, you know, with a little bit of dis distractions. Um, I don't do that anymore. I, I do all my work in here because I finally got the studio I've always wanted to have. Um, so I, uh, I stay put. Um, I will say that the biggest flashes of actual inspiration, like I think at inspiration, like most people think of it, doesn't happen that often because working artists, it's more about work than it is about just lightning striking. But when it does, it tends to strike me when I'm traveling, mm. when I'm in between spaces, you know, when I'm not in one place or another and I'm just moving somewhere, looking out the window of a train or a plane or what have you or even sitting in a train station or something. Um, that tends to be when just like, pow, something just invades my brain, um, sometimes turns into something concrete and sometimes it doesn't. But yeah, yeah the, as far as the actual work goes, no, I just stay here. What about you? That's fascinating. Yeah, more out of necessity early in my career, I often found myself storyboarding or whatever, you know, while promoting Secret of Kells, I would have been storyboarding or designing the characters for Song of the Sea in airports and so forth. But um, that that was more a sort of a necessary evil rather than a choice. And now I've spent the last six months um, traveling and, you know, traveling, but not constantly. Like while I was in Paris, I worked in the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. And when I was in Amsterdam, I was in Raymond Hoosman's Atelier. So I kind of had a place to go to. But I do keep a sketchbook as much as possible. And I do tend to draw wherever I am and so I kind of mix it up a lot but to sit down and do a proper finished piece it's quite um it's quite calming and quite nice to have your setup like I have a nice setup here with a standing desk and Cintiq and I tend to kind of bring together ideas and sketches and stuff here in this room and I sort of, this yep. is where the where the work yep. happens and if even if I'm in the studio I find that it's after hours or before people come in that I do the most work because most of the day then is caught up in 
dealing with other people and working with other people rather mm. than you know, drawing. So yeah. Okay. Right. This is a fascinating question here. Uh, Gabby Velez zero zero. What is your MBTI? Myers Briggs type indicator, personality typography. Most of the imagery and symbols in cartoon saloon movies look and feel a lot like what introverted intuition represents in a way. I don't know what my MBTI is, but introverted intuition, that, that resonates. <laughs> I don't know, how does that sound for you? Do you know what your MBTI I, I did one of these once, uh, maybe even twice. I don't know if it was that one or a different one that's similar. I don't remember that like you come out with like a four letter thing. Yeah. I don't remember what mine was. I think there was an F in there, a T, maybe an I. Uh, I know I know that introversion was part of it. Yeah. Um, but I can't I can't answer that very, very usefully. But intuition is huge in art. Like any but any artist is running largely on intuition in, in in most creative situations. Like you you plan stuff out and all that, but yeah, just having a feeling for what you want and what looks right is, yeah, it's enormous. So I don't know if that helps, but. Interesting question, all right. So this is Y.S. McCarthy. Uh, why do you think most animation artists are so unsettlingly dissatisfied with their creation slash produced work? My observation leads me to believe the studios know this and use it to their advantage to keep artists working an insane amount of their lives. <laughs> And that second part, I don't know, I'm a studio owner and I hope we're not uh, manipulating people's insecurity. <laughs> um, no idea if, that, if that's true of other places, but I would really hope that, you know, that isn't the attitude. There's a fun, um, there's a fun uh, poster or image in the studio. I noticed the other day because we recently renovated and people hung up stuff on the walls and was a, a really nice cartoon kind of saying that, you know, this idea that suffering um, uh, plus inspiration equals great art and then another idea that you know just like hard work and and uh, being hungry makes great art and then it's like no a happy environment happy artist makes great art you know and i think that's what i would think that i don't think you need to be um dissatisfied and unhappy all the time i think if you're there's a kind of a comfort comfortable edge that i like to be against like where i know i've done my best even if it's not uh, what where I'd like to be, but I know I'm on a on a journey to where I want to be, and I, I certainly feel as a draft yep. person that I'm. I I think I draw less stinkers now, like I draw less bad drawings now. I'm probably could still very capable of making a bad movie, but uh, in terms of just drawing, I I don't know if I'm unsettlingly dissatisfied, and I wonder if people in general who are that way, it's it's deeper than. You know, it's a, it's an insecurity in themselves or something. Mm, what do you think? Is it something maybe maybe I identified with that a lot more when I was younger? I was pretty hard on myself when I was younger, and I think you get to a certain age where you just, you know, are you are you, are you, are you well? Technically uh, dissatisfied. I have a bit of a different answer to that. Yeah, sure. I have a bit of a different answer. I can't speak to animation, um, <laughs> except that I know from the outside that animation is a very different world from illustration. Mm -hmm. um the, the I mean, for one thing the, the the legal contracts that you sign to be an animator are totally different than the ones that you sign to be to do an illustration gig it's it's a it's a whole different professional arrangement it's a different working world mm -hmm. um so i can't speak to that part of it mm -hmm. but as far as dissatisfaction is concerned i think if you're dissatisfied if you're dissatisfied in life if you're talking about just generally being dissatisfied, <laughs> then I would, I would just, I would just co-sign everything you just said. If you're talking specifically about a dissatisfied with your work, then my answer is different. I would say that dissatisfaction is absolutely the nature of the beast. <laughs> that I, I would give a similar answer to one I gave to a student once who um, I taught. I, I don't do it anymore, but I used to teach uh, illustration classes, which were really quite rudimentary. It was a lot about the basics. And one student um, was having a lot of angst about the work she was making and said something to the effect of like, when am I going to get to the point where what I see on my head comes out on the page? And I, I told her never. You will never get to the point where this is the same as that. It doesn't happen. 
because this is a different world. What your mind sees and what you create on the page are two separate things. And you have to learn to mediate between the two. And don't go into doing art, be it animation or illustration, whatever, believing that you will get to the point one day where everything just works because it doesn't, it doesn't happen. Um, I can only imagine how much of a fight it is to get a film from here onto the screen. And, and, you know, I call it a fight and maybe for some people that's the wrong word to use, but there's no question that it's a lot of problem solving. I'm not it's a lot of running into things that you need to, to contend with, whether you think of it as fighting or contending, I don't know. But for me, the dissatisfaction, the, the things in the last piece I did that I couldn't address or that it didn't do, that I want to do in the next one, that's what keeps me going to the next piece. Like that's pulling me forward yeah. every day and I love it and I wouldn't have it any other way. So to a certain extent, understand that like a certain amount of disquiet is part I mean, it's part of life generally, yeah. but it's part of it's part of bringing things into the world and don't expect to be just happy with all your stuff and learn to recognize your worst work. Like if you're putting a portfolio into the world, one of the biggest skills you need to have is to recognize out of all you know, 15 pictures you've got on your website, which one's the worst? You know, it doesn't it doesn't mean it's actually bad, but compared to all the other ones, which one's the weakest? Yeah, because that's the one that an art director or an art buyer is going to remember for sure the weakest one. And, you know, if you can go through your career, gradually whittling away that bottom tier of your portfolio, you're just going to keep getting better and better and better and better and better and better. And better. As for like being taken advantage of by studios, I have no idea. I'm not in a position to, <laughs> to do that. So. Taking advantage of Peter dude, all this time. No, but I, I think it has opened up a, Thing in my brain that is probably worth sharing is that animation for me is a co-creation so what i try and work on from one movie to the next is sometimes it's human skills like my soft skills how well i can communicate because a lot of that but i don't have a perfect movie in my head that i'm just trying to get a load of wrists to help me make you know i'm everyone who yeah. worked on it is a co collab like a filmmaker with me and they're bringing something to it and so I'm always happy with it at the end when I feel like it's been a productive collaboration. And what I might be unhappy with is where I think I might have failed either in communication or maybe like in Secret of Kells, I felt I learned a lot about tone. I felt that the tone of that movie changed a bit too much, um, maybe more than I would have liked when I look back on it. And that's what I tried to work on being more consistent with. But that's a very big, broad thing that has a lot of variables and a lot of factors that you know, change that. So any dissatisfaction I had was with my own work. And I was usually just inordinately proud of the fact that all these other talented people had come together to help me make a movie. And yeah. I was never dissatisfied yeah. with their work. I mean, how dare I? They've all given 110%. So, you know, it, it's just myself. But yeah, as an individual artist, as an animator, for example, or as a as a, a now I'm working on painting, of course, every painting I do, I can see, oh, man, I have to work on whatever yeah. for you yeah. I need to work better on contra i need to work better on my hands or my, i've got um knees i pinned up knees i was frustrated with my knees so i've been really focused on getting my anatomy right on knees so that i have a shorthand when i'm drawing quickly and not fluffing it so you're always looking at what's not great but i am honest to say after putting seven hard months into anatomy more satisfied with my drawings now than i was at the beginning and i'd be worried if i wasn't yes. That's not to say it's I think I'm perfect. Yeah, that's not to say I think I'm perfect. So, you know, anyway, yeah, I mean, very different, yeah. different people, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I guess we just better keep going. Uh, Gabby, let me see how many we have. Gosh, we have a lot. Okay. Well, it's fun. I'm enjoying chatting. So let's see. I hope it's interesting for everybody else. These are the kind of questions that, um, that I love, you know. All right. Gabby Velez, zero, zero. How do your ideas look when they're not born yet? I mean, what is the beginning of the creative process like? Fascinating. I'd love to hear what you have to say about that. Too. Well, um, I was mentioning before that the, you know, the world inside your mind uh, where images start is, <laughs> you know, it's only the final image that can, that is where you can see my effort to translate where they are before they're born. You know, I can't 
explain to you what they look like in my head besides drawing. Um, but how the creative process begins, I mean, sometimes it begins with something that arises um, before or beneath, you know, the conscious process where something just starts happening in your head and that's the driving force. Um, but sometimes it's just necessity. You know, somebody says, I, you know, I need this and that thing. I need this problem solved with a drawing. Um, and then it depends on the project, but, you know, I start thinking about things like what size and shape does this thing need to be? I might draw a box on a piece of paper. Um, I might say, okay, I don't see any images in my head yet for this piece of text, for example. Um, so let me dig into this piece of text and try to find some. Um, sometimes it's really hard. Like sometimes you have to, you have to invent some kind of new game you've never used before to try and pull something out of this, this uh, assignment. But usually you can look for, you can just read attentively and, and wait for, well, watch for the things that start to spark something visual in you. Uh, sometimes you can do it with sort of word association, um, coming up with metaphors for things. It really, it really depends on the assignment, but it's always rough to start with. You know, I, one of the things I would always say is never, when you're really trying to do your best piece, never get caught up in a detailed drawing at the beginning, you know, eliminate a lot of possibilities early on, draw quickly. Usually I'd say draw small, concentrate on shapes and concepts to begin with and don't get into like drawing hairs on people's mm. nose or whatever like just and you know order order things properly so from large scale to small scale from rough to detail um eliminating yeah. things as you go I feel, I feel like a process whether it's a movie or a piece of art it's, it's rare that i have it absolutely perfect in my head it's happened i've had images pop into my head fully formed and yeah. i've been fighting to get yeah. it more often it's like a polaroid developing you know and like maybe yeah. to speak to a movie because everything you said brought it a particular applies even to a movie i might start with even listening to music that makes me feel the way i want the movie to feel like it's like tone right. And then characters start to form. And once I kind of get, for me, once I get the characters down and I kind of know who they are, the next thing I'm looking for is kind of mythic moments, like moments that feel like, like, like a myth, like something that encapsulates what I want the movie to be about. And then, yeah, all those word games. I mean, for Wolfwalkers, Ross and I wrote a list of things we loved and things we hated and kind of connected them up because someone had told us that that's a good way to find, you know, some conflict, you know, like a lot of that stuff, yep. but the broad, the broad strokes, I think is like a, an inspiration board, whether it's on Pinterest or on paper and putting things out and music, that's really where I start. And then, mm -hmm. then it starts to become clearer and, and bit by bit becomes clearer. Yep. Um, character is really important for me. Usually I find the character before even the whole plot. I kind of know who the characters are and then I have to figure out <laughs> the journey usually with a collaborator or a writer so yeah i do i think the main thing i would say to people is that it's very you know broad you know, kind of grabbing pieces that inspire you and trying to pull them together unless you're lucky and you get one of those oh, i want to see right. that i i like that you mentioned uh the conflict thing because that's something that um comes up uh when you hear writers talk i mean i'm not much of a writer myself but you hear it a lot that um stories are essentially driven by, um, for person. lack of a, a more precise word in every case, uh, a conflict, some kind of a tension, some kind of an opposition. And the same is true of illustration. Um, when you're talking about uh, commercial illustration, um, even you know editorial stuff, uh, there's always some kind of an interaction or a conflict or a tension and opposition um, Otherwise, there's no story and it's not interesting because nothing is happening. Um, and you you do need to identify what that is before you start trying to make it an image about it. And I think that's probably one of the things that a lot of young artists who are just finding their feet haven't understood yet. You see a lot of people like just drawing a character. Mm. Uh, and it's like, it's great. You got to learn how to draw characters. But if you want to go somewhere with it, you have to understand, OK, character plus what, mm. you know? 
plus some kind of a life experience, plus another character, plus a setting, um, you've got to have something for it to act against. Otherwise, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything. Yeah, that's a good point. And that's usually the core of it. You know you're onto something when you've got some kind of contrast or conflict. No. Um, okay, so 1A Doyle asks, these posters and the films are so gorgeous, they really reflect the emotional heart of the stories. Would you have any advice for breaking in script writing or tips for the specific challenges for writing for animation? Did animation and writing style affect each other in the early process of the folklore triplets? <laughs> triplets, I like that. They are tri triptych, whatever. Um, okay, so that's mostly for me, I guess. Um, yeah, the emotional heart is where it always started. Um, the writing was um, something I hope I've been getting better at. I've always worked with really talented writers right from the beginning. But then, you know, at some certain point, it's kind of down to me and or my collaborators, how much of their input ends up on screen. And I don't think film is primarily about um, following the script like an illustrator i think there's a certain amount of interpretation that you do as a director so you're not just illustrating the script you're also taking it and changing it and adapting it so i think to that extent i'm a writer and i usually come up with the original idea so i think i can speak to that that it's been a back and forwards definitely the inspiration and reason to make these films are usually a feeling usually something as pure as music and images that i want to see together and then the writing comes, you know, and I work with a writer and then we're back and forwards. And sometimes an image that I'm sure I need to see on screen gets eliminated in that writing process because the writer will find that they're shoehorning something in just because I wanted to see it. And actually it's one of those right. darlings you have to kill, you know, and that's happened a lot. Yeah. And so I, there's a tension in the director visual part of me and the writing part of me all the time. And I, I think, you know, that's the essence of it. So um the writing is is ongoing all through the development of the look and the style and the, even the idea for the movie there's a, a writing thing you know. and the writing for animation i think is i haven't written for anything else live action or anything like that maybe for comics and things but um i think animation you have to remember has an entertainment value in and of itself like some of the let's say weakest scripts um, in terms of like modern concept of what maybe a live action script or some of the best animated movies. Think about Bambi, think about The Jungle Book, think about My Neighbor Totoro. You know, there, if you read those scripts, you might go, man, what really happened? You know, it could be stronger, it could be punchier, yeah. why this, why yeah. that? But yeah. they have a they have an entertainment value in the music and in the visuals and how they're animated and how things happen. And I think that was, as a writer for animation, you need to take that into account that it's not just all about... Um, you know, a super tight, dramatic script. Some of the value or some of the art of animation is in, you know, the character moments or the music moments or the just pure visual moments that the medium can bring to it. That's about the only thing that's different. Otherwise, it's just like writing for anything else, you know, all the all that good stuff applies. You know? I suspect the same thing also applies to comics and any other kind of writing where there's a where there's another sensory input. Like yeah. I've noticed in uh the the children's books that I think are the best that I really love are the ones that uh, where where there's almost no redundancy between the words and the pictures where you know the the words set something up but it's the picture that shows you the things and uh, I th there are a lot of um, kids books where you know it's very text heavy and they're describing things in words and then showing you the picture where i really don't think you need to do both yeah um and that, i think that's that's a lot of what that really fried my head that really fried my head as a kid i always remember reading the wind in the willows and i don't know whether the writer forgot that mr toad was a toad or whether he pictured him with hair but in the illustrations he was just like a toad in clothes right and then the writer would say ah yeah. he pushed the leaves out of his hair and i'm like wait has he got hair or doesn't he because it would bug me that the toad in the pictures <laughs> you know or whether he pictured a toad with hair i don't know or what or maybe he wrote not just calling him mr toad we have even yeah. we have more in common than i than i realized the, the wind in the willows is one of my favorite books yeah um ever it's amazing and people don't realize how amazing it is and that part is it's it's the it's it's this I, 
I, you read that book and you say, what do you mean he combed his hair? <laughs> it's the only time they met him. He's a toad. He combs his, what are you talking about? And even and, if it was right, goes he would be okay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. It would rat you, whatever, but apparently he has hair. And then there's a whole other slew of problems because there's humans in that book. Ah. And humans what? and frogs what? drive the same cars, right? <laughs> he drives the same cars as a person what does. Are they? But they live in ground. Yeah. Like they don't, there's that yeah. stuff is not worked out. And that's that's one of the reasons I love that book because he doesn't <laughs> actually have to yeah. sort any of it out. So he doesn't. Yeah, yeah. anyway. <laughs> Okay, cool. Uh, all right. Javika Leo, I really love your art. How do you find these styles? Because you break the rules of perspective and make it very stylish and unique. I love it. Would you share your process? You know, I think maybe I already answered that. I mean, in terms of process for me, the art style comes from a certain amount of it comes from me, of course, and my original concepts. But then I invite a lot of concept artists that I'm inspired by and usually my co-director is an artist too or my art director and they will bring a lot to their style and you know every artist on the team brings something to it and uh yeah i have the nice job as director of kind of picking the direction um but otherwise it's it's the work of you know many talented people that where we arrive at the final style and um, breaking the rules of perspective and making it stylish and unique well thank you <laughs> that's just taste isn't it it's like deciding what you think is stylish someone else might make it look something different yeah i think a big part of uh finding style because that's another thing that you worry about a lot when you're when you're getting started it, it's got a lot to do with uh with an inward focus i i can't like you say with animation it's a whole other thing because it's collaborative but um you it's a lot of like learning to understand yourself and like what not just okay do i like this do i not like that but maybe asking yourself why where does it come from who am i what am i trying to do and you're picking away at it over years trying things out and one thing uh, i heard years ago that really made a lot of sense to me is that a unique style is still borrowing from like it, they don't come out of nowhere unless you're like a complete you know amazing genius but generally it's a big melting pot and the more ingredients the better it, you can't kind of have too many ingredients because the more you're borrowing from the less obviously you're just copying one other style or one other artist and that can yeah. that can help your own style be more unique you know because you're you're absorbing Absolutely. a lot of influences yeah no doubt. Is, I'd agree with that. a bit on, on style as well tori kura and um, i won't apologize for everybody whose name i've read out and i'm probably butchering it if it's your real name okay sorry but love the Art Nouveau style of the posters. I also really like the artistic influence for Secret of Kells. I would be interested to hear about your visual development process, how you create your mood board and develop your visual treatment. Will you discuss the film's art direction as well? How do you come up with such interesting shapes and silhouettes when, when illustrating? So that's kind of for both of us. Maybe you want to take the take it first? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I love Art Nouveau. Um, I'm, I'm mostly a fan of uh, what's called Jugendstil, which is the... Um, Austrian and German uh, contemporary of Art Nouveau, somewhere between the geometry of Art Deco and the curves of Art Nouveau. Um, and yeah, as far as, you know, I don't do mood boards and stuff, that's more for you, but um, shapes and silhouettes, yeah, I mean, how do you find them with the pencil? You know, uh, you see them in the world around you um, and you, you know, you, again, paying attention to yourself and paying attention to the things that you notice um and just starting to be observing okay what things am i attracted to um and then you know over years and years of drawing you know you you start to notice certain things that you do that feel good and that you like and that work in your pictures and yeah i i like curves a lot i'm not as into straight lines um i like things that bring motion through the picture and then the other thing about shapes when you're illustrating for print and so on, not for motion necessarily, is starting simple, starting with like little thumbnail sketches where you don't have the space to go into detail. The only thing you have room for is the, the really basic shapes of the picture. If you start working that way and you make sure that you don't continue on with that piece until the tiny version of it with no details already looks good, Mm -hmm. And ideally, 
already starts to show what you're trying to show. Then you know that when you go on to the next step, the big shapes are already working, right? And you, and you do that at every stage and you leave all the little finicky stuff to the end. So that's, that's so what I would say exactly about you know, coming up with shapes. Exactly the same. I mean, we work on little tiny storyboards and if it works as a postage stamp, it will work on the big screen. So that's a thing. And for me, there's a little bit more thought in than just intuition for shapes i think we use a visual language where we we tend to try and make a story around shapes so like in wolf walkers everybody yeah, right. knew, everybody to do with the town were based on geometry squares like very you know everyone was kind of trapped in their little stiff worldview that they couldn't see beyond and so everybody was kind of square and stuff and then everybody in the forest was more flowy and animals were more flowy and so the shape language was kind of planned at the beginning um you know and maybe it would be an interesting challenge to try and tell a story where a square character is actually the free one or whatever but just for right, us yeah. felt those felt like the shapes that went with the the inner world of the characters all right so beetle is real 2.0 is what's a good way to get in contact with professional artists yeah. for me i would just say that event like playgrounds i was just at in berlin was great i got to hang out with like some artists like uh aaron blaze who directed uh, brother bear and wilder toop and young artists who were just coming up and for me that was lovely because after two years of everything being like an organized chat you could bump into somebody and and get chatting to them at an event like that so i recommend if you can at all go to those sort of festivals where the artists are you know mingling yeah, hundred percent. Uh, I've also had good luck um, writing to people. Uh, I think if you're going to write to an artist and you've got questions, um, take some time. Like, don't don't just drop a DM that's like, "Yo, how do you do this?" You know, take some time and think about it, and you know, communicate respectfully and 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 you know, <laughs> understand that you're asking a stranger for something. Um, because myself and any other artist that I know is happy to talk about art and answer questions, but is probably not super inclined to if the person isn't taking any care in how they reach out. Um, I don't but, like answering the same question that answered many times in easily available interviews before, frankly. I, I guess that. that not, yeah, I get that not everybody has read everything I've said, but generally if someone's doing a really deep dive in they want to write a piece for their college paper or whatever i tend to point them towards the many interviews i've done in the past and then if there's more you want to ask ask me that and i find myself paralyzed sometimes when i meet my heroes like i met miyazaki one time and i've oh, read right. so much about him i've read his autobiography i've read you know i know so much about him that it wasn't like there was a huge amount i wanted to ask him because i kind of feel like he shared everything that i could possibly want to know about his process he's been so effusive and so generous but I just sort of wanted to tell him thank you and thanks, you know, and it was still a pleasure to meet him and I was, I was happy to meet him, you know. So, yeah, think about the questions you're asking and, it, you know, if it is something that you feel you can only ask the person, um, that, you know, ask for their time to do it and, and be cheeky. I was so lucky as a young person, I, you know, to seek out my my heroes one way or the other and, and get chatting to them and talking to them. And the internet's amazing. You can get in touch with people and people are generally... Mm -hmm. If, some, if you come at somebody with genuine interest and uh, authentic questions, um, people, people are happy to connect, I find, in general. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I've, I've had uh, three experiences of uh, reaching out to heroes of mine in my life, and they all worked to varying degrees. So when I was a kid, I wrote to my favorite superstar ice hockey player. And he, uh, I sent him, a, I sent him a card, you know, one of my hockey cards, and he sent it back with a signature and a little letter. Blew my mind. I was like eight years old, loved it. Um, I wrote to a uh, singer in my favorite punk rock band. I had a little magazine, like a little self-published zine, yeah. and he gave us an interview, you know, in the early days of email. Um, and then much later, I uh, wrote to Yuko Shimizu when I was trying to figure out how to do editorial illustration. And in every case, you know, I just tried to just be like, be respectful and like write, you know, write like it's an important thing, you know, and not just kind of like write like the person owes you something. Uh, and in every one of those, in every one of those cases, the people were perfectly happy to respond and were very helpful. And um, 
yeah, I definitely encourage people to reach out, but you know, take it seriously and uh, don't be a jerk. Yeah, no, I have to say, and, and I, I do try to take time with fans and young people because it meant so much to me that people took time with me, you know, so a really nice thing to do. All right, so Eliza um, Markov is, what traits of the characters did Peter want to highlight that were perhaps not in the foreground or focus of the original artwork? How did they both feel this adds a new dimension or not to the richness of the stories? It's a very good question. It's a very good question. Um, well, I'm not sure um, that I did that actually. Um, I was looking at the at the the films as a as a whole. Uh, sometimes when I do a poster, my approach is to look for a central theme and really burrow into that and sort of talk back to the film a little bit, uh, a little more of a conceptual approach. And, but with these ones, I didn't do that. With these ones, I wanted to get, I wanted it to feel like the film plus, plus the way I draw, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it was more trying mm -hmm. to... Yeah, I loved that about it, Peter, because I wasn't, I, I'm a fan of your stuff and I knew I wanted to see our stuff through your filter. And I wasn't sure how far you'd go into, say, realism with the characters. And I think you found a lovely balance where it looks like the characters, they're not on model to be animated. They've got more details, little changes, but they're not a completely different, like, you know, how the character might look in a pure Peter Diamond illustration. You kind of found a happy place. And I love that. And the tonally and everything, they feel like the movie, yeah. It's very much about the tone for me, uh, because the thing that I was looking at was besides having having it feel right was relationships between mm -hmm. characters, mm -hmm. you know, uh, because there's so much of that in those films is, is, is about these connections between characters and how they're interrelated. And uh, so, I, yeah, I don't think I don't think I did the thing that the person is, is thinking of. Um, and as for what you mentioned, uh, it's a it's a challenge to illustrate a poster for an animated film, mm. and the, the approach that always seems to work best for anybody that I've seen do it well, um, including you know the, the famous Drew Struzan. He did posters for certain animated films like uh, American Tale and stuff. Right. And yeah, you keep the characters. You 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 keep them true to the way they look on screen. Because otherwise, it doesn't look like the character anymore. But then everything else, the setting that they find themselves in, you can be, you can be a lot more free with. And I, I wasn't going to try and make the, the, the scenes look like the way uh, you guys drew them. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm just going to interpret them through my thing. Yeah, I love it because I think one of the primary ones that really inspired me was you did the Green Knight illustrations. And they felt great. And I'm glad that there's a touch of that. I feel like there's a touch of that in, in what we did. And yeah, it still, sure. like, still look like our guys. Okay, so um, this is from Cool Beans, baby. What's the best way to teach yourself or learn illustration if you're not going to art school, but you want to work in illustration in the future? Uh, okay, well, I'll take that one first. Um, I mean, the obvious thing is to just draw a lot, you know. I, I can certainly recommend buying large amounts of very cheap sketchbooks and challenging yourself to fill them. Um, you can hardly go wrong doing that, but there's a couple more specific things. One of them is uh, quit hiding the hands and feet if you're doing stuff like that. Um, if, if there's something you're just terrified to draw and you're always finding an excuse not to draw it, take some time to try and be able to draw it if you need to. The other thing that I think is the biggest one perhaps is whatever this looks like for you, start getting some practice finishing stuff mm -hmm. because nobody hires you to do a sketch. Well, yeah, there are situations where you get hired to sketch things, but you, you know, what will often happen when you've got the luxury of, you know, no deadlines and no responsibilities for your artwork is you get to a certain point with a piece and you don't know what to do anymore. So you stop. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're doing it professionally, you you've got to deliver. And you've got to finish it. And if if the if the problems are not solved in the in the drawing, um, you're not done. So get some practice doing that. You know, it, some people get pretty far in 
pursuing and thinking about doing art before they've ever really sat down and said, okay, the next piece I'm going to do, I am going to make it as good as I possibly can, mm. even if it hurts a little bit. I'm going to put everything I've got into this thing. You see right? what you can do. And then you look at it with cold eyes and go, okay, I see where I need to work. That's right. That's right. And even, you know, there's in, in that sense of getting better, it's totally necessary. But also in terms of getting some practical experience with making something you can deliver mm -hmm. um, and, and not relying on your sense of your potential. Because a lot of the time you, you fill up a sketchbook and you're drawing the little heads and, you know, maybe a, a little piece of a castle or whatever it is. And your brain is alive with all the things that these might be you're like, ah, I can do this. Great. You got to do it. You got to You got to finish something. Even if it's just one thing, you, you need to learn to do that because um, otherwise you're you're cheating yourself a little bit. And when it comes to time to do things professionally, there's no excuses for anything, and you got to deliver or you don't get paid. So finish stuff, you know, make some finished pieces, and really that doesn't mean they have to be amazing, you know. It, it just you got to you got to make a thing that you could present, you know. That's the main thing that you don't get if you don't go to school. You don't get an assignment that has to be handed yep. in at a certain time, yep. which is what the real world looks like. You know, you have to get the projects done in time. But you can put that on yourself. And I do think the Internet's got loads of stuff. I use the new Masters Academy a lot, and I think it's great. It may be expensive, but it's not as expensive as going to art school. And you can do it at your own mm -hmm. time. But you can also just teach yourself with books from the library and online you know, YouTube videos and stuff. You can learn a lot. Uh, self-directed at least in terms of the technical side of things you know like actually learning how to draw the one, the one thing that you can't uh the one thing that people don't always um address when you talk about whether you need to go to school or not is um one of the most important things about going to school is meeting people mm -hmm. your professors yeah, who are connected yeah with your fellow students, the friends you make and the ideas that you bounce off each other. If you're not going to school, try to find, try to find other ways to do that, yeah. you know, find other artists and hang out with them. And yeah. if you can find older artists, you know, maybe there's just like a, maybe you're in a small town and there's a place that makes signs for local businesses, you know, maybe that's all it is, but connect with people who are doing it, connect with other people who are interested in what you're doing. Um, do that online too, join discussion groups, whatever, but that's that's something you need as well. I learned a lot in the early days of the internet and message boards and stuff. I learned a lot from other artists who were posting and sharing and stuff. I think you can build it for yourself. The things that schools do make it a bit easier because they give you assignments and you're put in a class. And I, to this day, work with people I went to college with. On the other hand, I do think the way we are now, it's possible to find that tribe online. And if you're like, I know some people who transitioned into the industry from similar industries like <clears throat> graphic design, and they've kind of built it for themselves. They've, they've taught themselves all the skills from online resources and the networking part they do by going to conventions and festivals and introducing themselves and putting together zines or films online with you know so you can you can emulate the all the things you get from school if you kind of identify them so yeah i think i think we've answered that question well and i do a question sometimes if i could go back in time how much in, now i can differentiate like a big part when i joined young irish filmmakers as a teenager and part of it was i wanted to meet girls because <laughs> i went to an old boys school and was happy to met my wife there but the other part was that i felt like that was a place to learn how to use the equipment and the equipment constantly changes, but what hasn't, what the main skill I learned from it was how to work with a team, how to work with other people. And that's maybe more particular to filmmaking than illustration, but that, that part, you know, the equipment we used back then, you wouldn't, nobody would use it these days, but that wasn't what I really was there to learn. I was there to learn how to work in a team. You know. All right. Valens 12, which is the most challenging character to animate? Depends on the animator. Uh, for me, I, I, I hoped I would get better at quadrupeds. Um, on Wolf Walkers and I didn't, I didn't have time. I was so busy directing and stuff that it really lent on the, the people in the team that were good at. And so I still find quadrupeds the most challenging to animate, just, just technically. All right, Tal Talia Cold, your art journey, learning, and how you realize what you really want to do. Well, that's a simple question. <laughs> Maybe Peter, I'll just <laughs> let you do that one because we're, we're, we're talking for a long time. We have two more questions to go. So maybe we'll take turns now. 
what was your art journey, your learning, and how you realized what you really want to do? In 10 sentences. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, uh, I, I don't know what the, when the first time I got a crayon in my hand was, um, but I never stopped. You know, I've just been drawing my entire life. So it's always been pretty clear what I wanted to do. Um, there's never really been much doubt. I Did think even when I was little and pretending to be a hockey player, I never really believed I was going to be a hockey player. Right. You know, it was always. Right. Well, the, I guess the only other thing is, is rock music. I mm. used to play in bands every bit as much as I drew. And the goal right. initially was to do both. Right. Um, and it, I had to choose eventually. And I chose the one that I was better at. So um, the journey. Yeah, man, that's 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 the art journey and life are not two separate things. Um, it's I think just, it's harder for the more talented people like yourself who can do both. Like I was kind of blessed and cursed with very limited talent. <laughs> so I kind of felt this is all I can do. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Some people are like really high grades, great at sport, beautiful. They could be actors. They go, you know, and they, they, they have to decide if they want to be artists or not. But then there's those of us who just didn't really have much choice. Right. Well, I don't know. I don't know how good I, I never really tested how good I really was at music. You know, um, I'm not sure I would have made it, but uh, it seemed viable for a while. And there's no questioning how much I loved it. Yeah, um, I Which miss think it. Is the most important thing. I think if you're thinking about realizing it's what you really want to do. I heard advice. The guy who ran Young Irish Filmmaker said it to a young person once about acting. And it was like, if there's nothing else you can do that you'll be happy with, then do it because it's a hard old the hard old road to take don't That's, take yeah. easier than anything else every everybody who's asking about working in art needs to hear that that's a hundred like, yes thank you for saying so it's the people who do art are generally speaking the people who will go nuts if they don't do it and you 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 have to have that you gotta be so stubborn because there's so many different ways to fail and, and you will fail in, in numerous different ways as you go along and you just got to keep doing it because you, you just need to do it. Um, and I've, yeah, I've always needed to make stuff and um, yeah, it, a lot of it's good luck too, as far as the journey, yeah. you know, oh. we're all born into <clears throat> circumstances that we don't choose. And some of us are born into circumstances where it's easier and some are born into circumstances oh, yeah. where it's harder. Oh, yeah. And I got lucky, man. Um, so that's a big part of it, too. Yeah, me um, too. I feel that, too. I was born at a time when it was possible to make a living at that. I don't know how many of my ancestors could just as easily have done what I did, but they just were in a time and place and socioeconomic right. circumstance where it just wasn't an option. So that, that mm -hmm. always fascinated yeah. me. I remember as a kid kind of learning about IQ and stuff and thinking, how many people are living in harsh conditions in maybe a developing country? that could be an amazing neurosurgeon, but they're just not even getting the opportunity yeah, exactly. to study. You know, so that always, that's always been terribly unfair. And I think it's why I've stayed very lefty in my whole life. So I've always felt that we need to equalize the opportunity for people. Um, but we're a long sure, way from yeah. We should be grateful those of, I mean, you know, when you travel to the third world and you see somebody who's trying to make it there, do something there against all the odds, then my hat always goes mm -hmm. off because they don't have all the, the, the privileges That's we right. have here. and even you know even within within our own circumstances and our own corners of the world there's there's differences there too sure. some of them you notice and some of them you don't some of them are you know egregious inequalities and others are just kind of little bits of dumb luck mm -hmm. and well, yeah is, those all those all kind of were both you know white dudes relatively middle class i guess you know i'm unconscious that you know there's a lot of other inequality in the business mm -hmm. no doubt hopefully we're all working it, most people i know who are um anyway um of any kind of good character are working to alleviate that those inequalities as much as any of us can right realms unreal this is the last question by the way i know of course these 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 are an, an there is an ubiquitous celtic style in your illustration, but I know it's in Song of the Sea illustration. The rendering of the waves reminds me of Japanese art. Do you draw influences from any other cultures? I guess we can both answer that to finish up. Yes, of course. I mean, I've been looking at um, Japanese animation right from the beginning of my career. I think you maybe saw some of the Hokusai wave influence in Song of the Sea. Loved Hokusai's prints as a student. Definitely look um, to 
you know, the one thing I learned when I first delved into both the folklore and the art style is how similar they are to other cultures around the world. And so I've always loved, you know, um, Eastern European and Russian animation just as much as Western American animation. And then some of the American animation or British animation that I loved growing up, I've learned it, you know, took its inspiration in turn from earlier art forms internationally. So I definitely think we look not just in the so quote unquote Celtic art, but you know, to art history in general. How do you feel? Uh, yeah, well, um... This is, I mean, I feel like I could write a book about this question. <laughs> um, let me try and put it simply. Um, there are things in art making where I am looking specifically at things that I consider to be my own heritage. So um, I'm Canadian, but I'm also British. I was born in England. Um, and when I look to use is the wrong word, but to, to, uh, to make things from out of folklore. Uh, I, don't, I don't look to Canadian ancient folklore because I don't feel like it's my heritage. Um, I do look to the British Isles, even though I didn't grow up there. But that's, that's when it's about stories and when it's about ideas. When it comes to making pictures, when it comes to how the picture plane works, I don't draw any distinctions. I, in, to a certain extent, I consider all, you know, illustrators, drafts, people, drawers of stuff, painters, that's in a certain way, that's one culture. And mm. when it comes to Japanese art mm. specifically, there's a lot of different things that I resonate with uh, in terms of, you know, um, classical, I what I would call classical Japanese illustration, the wood blocks, all of that stuff. There's a number of things that I love about it. One of the things that I love about it is what I once called graphic shorthands for elemental forces, which is basically things like uh, water, wind, rain. Um, they've found in within that tradition there are these amazing graphic reductions or abstractions of these undrawable elemental powers. And water is one of those. And it's not just, you know, it's not just Hokusai. There's uh, loads of other Japanese artists who have a broadly similar approach to dealing with water. And you, you can look to, you know, you can look to Canaletto and the way he painted water. It's basically just blue with little white lines on it. Mm -hmm. um, you, you can look at uh, Da Vinci in some of his sketches. He's studying mm -hmm. how water flows and it's these very hairy kind of lines. And water's not going to allow itself to be really captured. Um, and you have to find your way of doing it. And I love the way that um, the Japanese tradition has, has solved a lot of those problems. So that's one of the places that I draw from. And I know in my poster, it's very Japanese looking yeah. at the waves yeah. for sure. Yeah, it's beautiful. I love it. And I think that's the thing to talk about and to have at the forefront of our mind when we talk about these notions of cultural appropriation, which obviously is awful. And, you know, even in my own career, I wanted to make, uh, you know, the Irish uh, fairy tale movie before Disney or someone did. That right. said, I do think the history of art is maybe cultural appreciation. Like I was recently in the Netherlands and I went to the Delft Museum. My wife is a ceramicist and it was fascinating to see that what we consider Delft pottery began as Dutch potters admiring Chinese porcelain and trying to mimic it down to painting Chinese scenes on the porcelain. Sure. Then they yeah. started to paint Dutch scenes on the porcelain in the Chinese style. Then the Chinese yeah. people artisans who'd never met these Dutch artisans because this was at a time of international trade but not a huge amount of uh, you know individual migration they would see these Dutch porcelain pieces come back to China and then they would like they would go this is great and they would start painting Dutch scenes like Amsterdam in China on the you know yeah. and to me that's cultural appreciation that's artists taking and borrowing and looking at each other's work 
you know, and similarly, you know, Japanese prints arrived into into Europe in the in the eighteen hundreds, and suddenly wallpaper designers and different people were looking at them and taking inspiration. I think it's about respect and appreciation and admiration rather than stealing or trying to pretend sure. that you're I mean, sure. it's not open being yeah. open to where you're taking it from. And I think it's totally that that's the language of culture. Like everything is appropriation in a certain way. It's just about the attitude towards it and it's not mocking it's disrespectful but rather out of respect and appreciation i think we can all continue to learn from each other's cultures without feeling um defensive of it you know yeah and you know that that, that encounter of, of um europeans at the turn of the previous previous century uh with japanese and chinese artwork um i'm that that breed that bred most of the art that I'm most influenced by. People all often see the Japanese influence in my stuff, um, but the stuff that's more directly forefront of my mind influencing me, <clears throat> they tend to be European artists of that period. But what those European artists of that period were doing is what you and I talked about before, which is taking the Western rules of art and having them be reintroduced to graphic art. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the East that did that for the Europeans. And they started combining these two things together. And that's what I love the most yeah. is, is, is both of these things. Like I've never wanted to make my stuff be a copy of Japanese art, um, but there's all of this graphic stuff uh, that lessons taught to me by looking at Japanese work and European work influenced by Japanese work. And uh, yeah, yeah, so that's, yeah. But, but when it comes to storytelling, when it comes to that sort of stuff, which characters I use, hmm. that's something where, at least for me, like I don't have political judgments for other people, how they choose to do it. But for me, um, I for a lot of reasons, right? A lot of very personal reasons to do with the way that my life has gone. I look at stuff that I feel is connected to, mm. you know, the land I was born. On. And what's awesome is you're looking at it not as someone who grew up in Britain. So you're bringing a different perspective to it. And I think it's equally right. valid. Like do, in just as much as I love your interpretation of our characters, because you're seeing it through a different lens, I think it's also really interesting whenever people from other cultures, you know, it's it's fascinating to see. I would love to see, you know, a, a, a Native American artist tell a, a Japanese folklore story. What would that look like? What would they bring? How would they add to that? You know, so I think it's fascinating. All right. Well, great chats as usual, Peter. Unfortunately, there is yeah. no wine between us this time, but maybe next time. Unfortunately. Yeah. And thanks. Well, to I look forward to the next time. Yeah, and thanks to all the people who ask questions online. Um, I really appreciate the engagement. Yeah, and I, I had a, I had a question uh, from on my Facebook group as well um, that didn't make it into our official list, but we, I, we, we answered it already. So oh, good. just good. wanted to acknowledge in case he's watching that I, he wasn't forgotten, but his question has been amply answered. I think. Thanks a lot, everyone.